thoughts I want to share with you today, uh, I, I will just tell you right out that um, uh, the last few weeks I've had, I've had a struggle putting this together. And the reason for that is it's such a complex subject, and uh, what do you do in 30 or 40 minutes? Um, I often like to write out what I'm going to share, because my, my mind wanders, and sometimes reading or referring to a written manuscript helps keep me on track. But... Uh, it dawned on me partway through that if I wrote this one out, it would take three or four hours to read it to you. And uh, that would be altogether too long. And so I began to ask myself, when it comes to the so many messages out there, what is of most importance? What, how, how can we focus? And uh, that's been something of a challenge. So I'm going to do something today I don't often do, and I'm going to rely on the same notes on the screen that you see, and I'm not going to be prepared in terms of a manuscript, but I want to share from the heart some concerns that I have developed over the years as I've been a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Before we do that, I would invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we're going to consider an important topic today. It's, it's huge. It's so all-encompassing. Help us boil it down. Help us focus on those things that are most critical to our salvation. Uh, teach us today. May we have something we can grasp hold of that will guide us in these last days as we hear around us so many messages. Send your spirit to be present. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A review. A couple weeks ago, we looked at so many voices. We are told in Scripture that there are attempts to deceive. There will be, intentionally or unintentionally. Can't avoid it. It will happen. It's prophesied in Scripture. It's been happening ever since the garden, and it will continue to happen until the Lord returns. Deception of the very elect. In other words, deception of God's people is possible. And Scripture also tells us that deception from within is more likely than deception from without. Why? Well, we talked about many reasons a couple of weeks ago. Deception from within is unexpected very often. Deception from within uh, comes when we least expect it, from people we least expect it to come from. There's a certain uh, comfort level that develops with being a, a a Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, maybe, maybe indeed over a period of many years, we become almost lethargic <laughs> in our views. Oh, we have it mastered. We have it down pat. We know what we believe. And then a new idea comes along. A new idea festers for a time. And before we know it, we've been sucked up into something that isn't quite right. The Bible says we have need of a discerning heart, a discerning mind. 
A few thoughts before we get into this any further. Questionable messages within our church are not new. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was established in 1863, and within months, <laughs> there were voices speaking new and different messages. Now, new and different messages aren't necessarily suspect, you understand. In fact, Scripture tells us that the Lord from time to time sends new messages via his prophets. He has new messages for us. I suspect there will be new messages between now and his return that will clarify the truth. So having new messages is not a problem. But just know that there are questionable messages too that are a potential problem and these grow side by side with the new and true. The new and false is there alongside the new and true. Number two, on this occasion, the purveyors of these messages will remain nameless. <laughs> if you have read something from one of these messengers, one of these voices that you wonder about in terms of its theological soundness, that sort of thing, I would be happy to talk to you later in a private time together. But it's not my purpose to name any of the many messengers who have brought to us some questionable messages in the past and in the present. So we're not going to name names. We're not going to talk about individuals. We're going to talk about some bigger picture items. We cannot begin to explore every false message in the time we have. I'm going to assume that some of the false messages that are coming our way today are ones that you recognize as false, and we just won't spend time today. For example, there have been challenges and will continue to be within our church to the veracity of the creation story. Did it really happen the way the Bible describes it? Well... Let's leave that one for another time and place. There are challenges today, even in the Adventist church, as to whether or not uh, the Seventh-day Sabbath is, in fact, critical. And perhaps the Lord has uh, indeed uh, allowed for other days of worship um, in lieu of, instead of, in place of, his holy seventh day. I'll leave that for another time and place. But there is something interesting to me. When I go back and look at some of the messages brought to us as a people from our inception in 1863, I discover very often that that is same song, second verse. Same song, third verse. Same song, fourth verse. There's an old saying that says, what goes around comes around. <laughs> or there's another one, there's nothing new under the sun. Oh, sure, it's tweaked a bit and... You know, it, initially it may not appear to be the same song, but when you start digging, you discover that there are certain repetitive themes brought to us by these presumed messengers of God that don't ring true. 
And those same themes recur. Every few years, over and over again, keep coming back. I also want to remind us, as Paul does in Romans, that there are things about God that are truly unsearchable. That we don't understand them. John alluded to some of those this morning in Sabbath school lesson. Do we really understand what it meant for Christ to take on humanity and be both divine and human? Do we really understand the depth of God's love and grace? Do we really, you know, there's so many questions. We don't have full answers. We're told that we're going to study those things through eternity. So just know that there are, at times, questions for which answers are not readily available in our frail human state as we think, as we reason, as we attempt to understand them. We are, after all, human. And God is God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now, I want to preface some of what follows by saying that I am not opposed to education. I am not opposed to reasoning. In fact, uh, Ruth will tell you that I spent altogether too many years studying and teaching. I'm very much in favor of expanding one's mind, improving one's thought processes, the Lord has given us gifts here, and we best use them. So reason and attempts to understand, those in and of themselves are not at all bad things. I want you to understand that at the outset. But reality is, when I go back and I look carefully... Back to the beginning of our church in the 1800s, mid-1800s. And I look at what's happened since then, and I look at some of the voices that have come along, and some of the messages that have been proclaimed. As I begin to try to relate those, and understand how they interact, and understand uh, what the difficulties or challenges with some of them may be, it dawns on me that there are some basic underlying questions that have tended to precipitate these messages, have caused people to wrestle with ideas, and in wrestling with these ideas, alternative views have emerged. Some of them in keeping with Scripture, and some of them not in keeping with Scripture. What are those questions? Well, here are a few of them. Who are humans and where did we come from? If I were to uh, uh, put you on the witness stand and, and ask you that question, could you answer it? I hope so. I hope so. But it's a, an important question. And bright minds have wrestled with this question and tried to understand it from a human perspective. Or how about this one? What is sin? Now, we all know the typical definitions as given in Scripture. Sin is what? Transgression of the law. Yeah. Uh, you'll hear people say sin is separation from God. Uh, you'll hear a variety of definitions of sin. But do we really understand 
the depth of sin and what it entails. Um, I'm not sure we do. I think there's more to learn about sin and the awful thing that it is. How about this question? What are sin's consequences? Well, we read the wages of sin are death. But then we wrestle with that question. And I hear people say, well, but, but if God's loving, you know, and he offers to forgive us and send our sins to the depth of the sea, then what are sin's consequences? Questions. Questions. And our attempts to arrive at answers lead to truth in some instances as it relates to what Scripture tells us as Scripture describes it, and on other occasions it leads to erroneous notions of what sin is and how it affects us. Here's another question that's common to these voices and these messages. Why did Jesus die on the cross? You uh, perhaps have not thought about it much, but as I've been studying this lately, I went back to, um, to 1888. Uh, you will recall, some of you remember church history, will know that uh, there was a general conference session at that time where a couple of gentlemen came uh, and shared ideas about... Uh, what it means to truly live by faith, to truly accept God's grace, and, and the church modified how we stated this gift that Jesus gives us. But yet those same voices, a short time later, had essentially concluded that Jesus' death on the cross was unnecessary. That Jesus' death on the cross was in fact um, something other than the sacrificial gift we had been teaching. How about this question? What is God's character? What is God's character? A lot of the voices and messages out there are attempts to answer that question. From a human perspective, with reason, with thought, with care. Uh, how can God be, well, how can God be loving? And how can he be just at the same time? In fact, the whole question of how we are saved is at the heart of many, many, if not most, of these challenges to our faith. So what are the deceptions that you most often encounter out there? I want to couch them, if I may, remembering that we only have a few minutes here. We don't have uh, days. <laughs> I want to couch them, if I may, in some potential dichotomies. And if you do any reading at all to try to understand what these messages have contained, you discover very quickly that you're going to run into dichotomies. This and that. This and that. Let me show you some examples. There's a dichotomy between faith and reason. 
My Bible says, come now, let us what? Reason together. Reason's not a bad thing. Reason's not a bad thing. My Bible also says, the just shall live by... It doesn't say live by reason. It says live by faith. May I suggest you can have both? And if reason tends to take the upper hand and destroy faith, may I suggest it's a false message? There have been many messages brought to our church over the years that have elevated reason, human reason, to a position that is far, far, far beyond the need for faith. It destroys faith. It undermines the role of faith. Faith and reason must, must go together. How about this one? Reason and inspiration. <laughs> whether it's inspiration of Scripture, or whether it's inspiration is found in the spirit of prophecy, whether it's inspiration of other kinds, uh, inspiration found in the natural world out there, uh, whatever sort of inspiration it is that we're trying to understand, if in fact our reasoning as human beings appears to conflict with the inspired statement, do you know what often happens? Reason trumps inspiration. Well, the Bible must not really mean what it says. Because my mind can't get around that notion. My reason tells me it's this way. Oh my. That's dangerous ground to be on, to rely solely on your reason. The Lord said, come and reason together. <laughs> Don't isolate yourself over here and reason yourself right away from faith and inspiration. Don't go there. It's dangerous ground. How about this dichotomy? Oh my, have we struggled with this as a people? Christians through the ages have struggled with this. And it shouldn't be a struggle at all. But we wonder, how can God be a God of love? And how can the Bible describe a God who punishes at the same time? <laughs> that argument goes clear back to the Garden of Eden. Well, actually, before that, Satan in heaven. You know, uh, but the, the, the argument was basically uh, <clears throat> the, the, the outcome, the, the, uh, the result of sin is often, as described in the Old Testament and in the New, punishment. But all of society tells us that is not compatible with love. I remember when I was teaching junior high kids. <laughs> and they would always say to me, we want to be treated fairly. You ever heard that before? Just treat us fairly. Well, you know what they were really saying, don't you? When it was that individual that was in trouble? That individual's tune changed a little bit. They didn't want to be treated equally and fairly. 
They wanted me to recognize their unique situation as special, <laughs> as unique, as deserving extra grace. And society has come to tell us, has come to tell us that any time we, in fact, uh, today, if as a parent you choose to punish your child in public, you could be in trouble. Society has us believing that any form of punishment at any time, any consequence that indeed we follow through with, is contrary to love. Well, I'll tell you right now, I've wrestled with that in the past too. Because I've read the Bible. And I've noticed that there are times when God punishes and you can try all you want to get around that fact, but it is abundantly clear. Uh, some, have, uh, some have concluded from a reasoning standpoint that love is so strong, God's love is so strong and so perfect that it can't allow for the other, the, the punishment part of it. And so what happens it's an interesting phenomenon, but what happens is in some cases, these voices in the world have even chosen to rewrite the parts of Scripture, paraphrase the parts of Scripture to make it sound more palatable, to make it God sound more loving than Scripture really portrays Him to be. May I suggest to you that the God you serve can be perfectly just and perfectly loving at the same time? That's one of those dichotomies I can't get my head around. Totally. I try. All of society's messages to me are pushing me toward one end of that spectrum, the love end, and saying, oh, you can't have both together. You know, I would suggest to you that the Bible says God loves us so much that he is going to put an end to sin and suffering. And the Bible says that is coming, that judgment is required, and I don't find that judgment a fearful thing. Now, for those of you who grew up in the Adventist church, there are a lot of, a lot of folk who have grown up in our church who have come to view God as some sort of an ogre. They've come to somehow believe, and, and, and I'm, I just feel sorry for them that 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 was the message they got somewhere along the way, either through their family or through the church or through our schools, that somehow this, this whole thing of living for God meant to, to rack up the credits and avoid the demerits. And boy, if you, uh, if you slip up, this angry God is going to whack you a good one. Well, the fact of the matter is that God sent his son as a substitute to receive the penalty that is due us. I can't imagine anything more loving and gracious than that. God on earth. Related concepts, justice and mercy. How can you be fully just and fully merciful at the same time? <laughs> I have yet to find a person who is. John, I suspect 
the best judges in the city of Bend in their efforts to carry out justice and be merciful struggle with that balance. Society struggles with that balance. Humans struggle with that balance. But the God I serve is perfectly just and completely merciful at the same time. He says to us, I am not willing that any should perish. And he's provided a way for us to avoid the wages of sin. Oh, we've been arguing about this one a long time. Faith and works. The interesting thing to me is that in the Adventist church and in other places, people who dwell on this and focus on these messages uh, as it relates to faith and works struggle a little bit and um, <clears throat> they conclude that... Um, very often they conclude that uh, we're too works oriented. Therefore, we're going to move in the faith direction. And in the process, <laughs> in the process, they develop a whole new system of works. They replace one perspective of what it means to work out your salvation with another perspective of what it means to work out your salvation, both of which are very reflective of the system that the Jews had developed over time, that the Pharisees had developed over time. <laughs> it's interesting how we, uh, any, anytime we're really trying to resolve these questions by reason, human reason, faulty human reason alone, we may take a big detour in the name of faith or something else, but we end up right back in the works boat. Or how about this one? Grace versus merit. No matter how often we talk about it, there's some part of us, some part of us that thinks of merit as being necessary for our salvation. That somehow we've got to measure up. <laughs> the Bible says that our works, the measuring up, is the outcome, is the outcome of justification of receiving the grace God offers. It's not, it's not a necessary condition for salvation. It's a natural result of accepting salvation. We change inside, not because we're working hard at it, because but because the Lord is working in us and through us by his Holy Spirit, prompting us to live in new ways, better ways, the Lord doesn't just want to accept us the way we are. Oh yes, he accepts us. He offers justification to us. But then he says, you can, you can be so much better than you are. Let me transform you. Let me make you into what I would like for you to be. And his vision of what we can be is so much better than our vision of what we can be. I can't imagine a better thing than to just let him have at it and see if he can change me into someone better and better and better and more like him. Or here's another dichotomy. The New Testament God and the Old Testament God. 
they can't be the same God, can they? <laughs> yeah. I've been to churches where they uh, have Bibles in the pews. They're only the New Testament. <laughs> when you ask them, why is it? Well, they say that's, that's because that's the God we serve. We, we don't serve the God of the Old Testament. Well, last time I checked, all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. <laughs> so it's these dichotomies, these, these, these difficult contrasts that cause us to develop at times false messages. In fact, I would dare say that many of the people who have uh, come to offer false messages to the church began proclaiming those messages with no thought at all of intentionality to deceive. They sincerely believed what it is they were coming to believe. But very often, very often, they allowed reason to totally replace faith. And when they couldn't see how two concepts could be compatible, they discard one or the other. Lest you think when people look at the New Testament versus the Old Testament God, that they always opt for the New Testament God, I'm here to assure you that's not true. There are some who opt for the Old Testament God as they see it, as they read it, and they say, there's the truth. Either approach is a mistake. False teachers will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. I read this for a long time through the years. I didn't make much sense of it, I guess. You know, I'd, I'd see a television preacher, um, and I would know that the message I was hearing was not according to Scripture. But the television preacher was saying, worship God, pray to Him. Jesus saves. They were saying all the right words. And I said, well, the false teachers are likely to be denying the Lord who bought them. And then I went back and I read that text more carefully. And I looked a little bit at some of the original language. And I began to see that an emphasis here even denying the Lord who, what? Bought them. That's an important part of that text. You can assent to Jesus, but deny his saving power. Either by what you choose to do, or choose not to do, choose to say, not to say. In other words, just using Jesus' name is not what this is talking about. It's something far greater. So, as I thought about these big questions, and I thought about these dichotomies, and how those, those concepts create tensions, and, and we, we find ourselves wanting to decide on one or the other, rather than recognizing perhaps that the Lord can be equally both, I began to look at some of the comments from Adventist authors. In other words, either current Adventists or uh, people who were Adventists uh, among us and have left, um, some who have passed away but left a written record. And I began to look and I discovered some very interesting phrases. 
God accepts us as we are. At one level, that's very true, is it not? He does. He, he says, come to me, all you who are laboring or heavy laden. He doesn't talk about uh, waiting until we've changed. He accepts us as we are. So as that reads on the surface, I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. But as you begin to read the author who said that, in some of their writings, I started reading a little further, and it was clear to me that they were meaning in that phrase, God accepts us as we are, and that's just great because I'm going to continue to be who I am. God does not work that way according to Scripture. God accepts us as we are, but then he gets busy remaking us if we accept him, if we allow him to do that in us. If you have uh, accepted Christ and you've recognized he's accepted you and you've been living in this relationship for 20 years and you wake up realizing that you are just like you were 20 years ago, <laughs> there's something happened there. May I suggest maybe you didn't really accept him? He will accept you, but it's a transactional thing. He says, I'm knocking. Let me come in. Let's see what we can do in your life. He offers. Or how about that one? Christ did not need to be executed. Uh, there have been several Adventist voices through the years who have come up with that notion. They said Christ did not need to die. Well, I don't have time today to prove from Scripture that he needed to die if we were to have hope of salvation. But it is clear from beginning to end, over and over and over again, the inspired writers of Scripture tell us, tell us that Christ's death was substitutionary and necessary. Similar idea, sacrifice was not demanded. Or, or this one, sin is not a legal problem. <laughs> Uh, one of the voices in the Adventist church of quite a number of years ago, uh, he, he was pretty big on this one. Um, he, uh, he was convinced that uh, the, the, the real wages of sin, the penalty of sin, if you will, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a law problem at all. It was something entirely different. Or how about this one? The shedding of blood was not needed. Or sin is not something recorded in a book. Or God wants to bring us to the place where we won't have to be forgiven anymore. <laughs> Again, at one level, that last statement, I don't have too much trouble with. He wants to bring us to a place where we're not sinning. Is that not true? Absolutely. But then when you read it in context, that author was saying and going on to say, um, he wants to bring us to the place where we won't have to be forgiven anymore. And so, and then, and then they begin to talk works. They might not have even known it, but they begin to talk works. I, so I've got to do this and I've got to do this and and, and, and he'll help me, but I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and pretty soon, 
Pretty soon it was a works message all over again. And if I work at this hard enough and I arrive at this perfect state, then, then he, doesn't, he doesn't need to forgive me. In other words, I'll get there. Give me enough time. Hmm. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were what? Still sinners or yet sinners. Christ what? Died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved, how? By his life. Not by something we do. <laughs> and not only that, but we also, what? Rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when it finally dawns on us that God can, in fact, exact a penalty for refusing to accept his gift, for being determined to pursue our life of sin, and that that is not... Something to fear because he offers the solution to the problem. And his promises are sure. And we are saved by his life and we accept that gift. <laughs> Paul says, Paul, well, you saw it there. Let's go back. Did you notice this? What's that top line say? From wrath. We are saved from wrath through him. In other words, God has... A point at which he is going to exercise judgment and sin and sinners will be destroyed. But Paul says, Paul says, having been reconciled, we are saved by his, Jesus' life. And then Paul gets excited. When it dawns on him, he says, we rejoice in God. We're not angry at God. We're not frustrated by God. We're not scared of him. We rejoice in him because of what Jesus has done for us. That is true love. That is true love. By his perfect obedience, Jesus has satisfied the claims of the law. And my only hope is found in looking to him as my substitute in surety, who obeyed the law perfectly for me. By faith in his merits, I am free from the condemnation of the law. Amen. Amen. Notice the emphasis. By what? Faith in his merits. He clothes me with his righteousness, which answers all the demands of the law. I am complete in him who brings in everlasting righteousness. He presents me to God in the spotless garment of which no thread was woven by any human agent. There is nothing we can do salvation is a gift how much is of Christ it says in the next sentence all is of Christ and all the glory honor and majesty are to be given to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world Friends, you can count on that. That is scriptural through and through. 
And God's promises are sure. So, real quickly, it's getting late, but we'll, we'll finish this up. Are there cautionary flags then to look for when evaluating new messages? I'm going to try to summarize these very quickly, and then um, if you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to talk with you further. The message originates primarily with one individual or a very small group. Now, sometimes truth originates there too. True messages. So remember what I said before we go through this list. I want to remind you that I'm just simply saying there are potential flags, red flags, yellow flags. In other words, don't accept blindly a message that comes to you in this fashion. Examine it in light of what? Scripture. Okay. So oftentimes, false messages begin with one individual or a very small group. There can be true messages as well. Truth, but, uh, but it's a caution. The message seeks to hammer home one or two primary ideas. We... All through our history, we've had people come with messages. They say, I'm a messenger of the Lord. He has sent me to the church. And then they hammer home this, this narrow little idea that may or may not have much to do with, with faith and may or may not have much to do with salvation. But the Lord's given this to me and I'm going to hammer on it until I convince all of you or all of you reject it at your peril. Anytime, anytime a message comes that's based primarily on one or two little notions from Scripture, watch out. The message purports to supplant an old truth with new light. Now, I don't have a problem with the new light. I want you to look at the two... 50 cent words in the second line. <laughs> Do you know the word purports? What does that mean? <laughs> what? Pretends, Pretend, suggests, uh, wants to argue in favor of. To supplant. What does that word mean? Root out and replace. Replace. So I don't have any problem with new light. I believe there is new light on occasion that is given to God's people. The Bible says that. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. The problem is when the new message wants to uproot the way marks, so to speak, and replace them with something radically different and new. The problem I have with that is, how changeable is God? He's not. God doesn't make mistakes. And if it was God's truth in the garden, and God's truth when Jesus was here on earth, and God's truth today, it's truth. Now, he had, on occasion, made some conditional prophecies where he said to his people and says to us today, if you'll do this, then this will happen. But as far as truth about God, who he is, what salvation is, how it works in our lives, those things don't change. We may get new understandings, Call it new light if you wish. But if it replaces old truth, watch out. The message exalts human reasoning, downplays the role of faith, and or a thus saith the Lord. I can't tell you how many things I've read through the years from mess messengers who, uh, who fall into this trap. 
when they have their human reasoning arrive at a certain destination, they're bound and determined that any scripture that doesn't comport with that either is a scripture they fully don't understand or worse yet, it can't be true because reasoning trumps faith. Don't go there. Dangerous ground. The message relies on a narrow selection of Bible texts or spirit of prophecy quotes. I was reading the other day a fairly lengthy article, and uh, they were quoting from the spirit of prophecy to support their point. And I remembered having read that passage in some time in the past, and it didn't sound quite true. So I went and looked it up <laughs> and read the entire passage and they had conveniently left out certain sentences and paragraphs and removed it totally from its context. To the casual reader, spirit of prophecy, reference, must be true. It wasn't. It wasn't. It put words in Ellen White's mouth. Words she didn't mean or say by selectively. You know, the government's really good at that. <laughs> every, time they send, every time they send something out, or to, they, they have this word called redacting. Are you acquainted with that word? There you take an original document and then you remove certain parts in the name of protecting, you know, uh, someone or, or security or, or something. But the bottom line is redacting means to edit, to portray certain things and not other things. And <laughs> there are some experts out there who are redacting the Bible and the spirit of prophecy all the time. The message invites quick conclusions and may take on a condescending tone targeting those who may question it. I can name two or three people in the past, I won't do that here, but two or three people in our past as a church that are, have become, had become quite expert at that. Uh, kind of like, well, if you don't understand this message I'm presenting, it's because you're uneducated. You're, you know, the whole message was, uh, if you can't see it, that's your problem. It's kind of condescending. Or how about this one? The message is exclusionary or isolationist in focus. It calls its adherents to separate from the church. I, I suspect any message like that. Uh, you know, come out of her. You know, the church is Babylon. And if you'll follow me, I'll lead you to someplace better. Be careful. The message has not been subjected to scrutiny by the larger church body. Or if it has, it's been rejected as error. In other words, find out. If there's a questionable message in your mind... Uh, find out if the larger church body has reviewed or studied it. And uh, they do on occasion study those carefully and write position papers that show clearly what they believe the Bible to say uh, with proof texts in the whole nine yards. And you can study it for yourself. Or how about this? The message goes on the attack targeting specific individuals as apostates or the remnant church as Babylon. As best I can tell, any of the messages that I have read through the years that have done this have proven to be false. It's not a tactic the Lord would approve of. If the individual proclaiming that message is sincere, and if indeed they have truth, that in love they will attempt to reform, 
to help the church grow. In other words, they don't attack. Attackers generally have a questionable message. The message speaks of grave dangers to befall those who fail to accept it. There was one Seventh-day Adventist who used this to a fault. Every time he would speak to a group of Seventh-day Adventists, he would say, if you don't follow me, if you don't come away with me, this will happen to you, and this will happen to you, and this will happen to you, and he, he, he literally scared you into following him. That's not the God of love I serve. That's not the Lord's message to us. The message inspires desperation or despair in its hearers rather than faith and confidence in God's promises. Any message, including misinterpretations of Scripture, that truly inspire desperation or despair in the hearers, well, it's a mistake. And sometimes I will admit to you that we as a church have taken truth and portrayed it in a way that has inspired desperation or despair. That's the human part of us. And we haven't done well on occasion with that. And people have left our family because of that. We need to be portraying the faith and confidence in God's what? Promises. That needs to be the focus. The track of truth lies close beside the track of error. Remember the, the pathway? <laughs> Broad is the way. Narrow is the way. Which one are we on? The narrow? Yeah. And guess what? If you're on a very narrow track, there are can be precipices on both sides. I remember in Alaska, in closing, I'll share this little story. I remember in Alaska, when we lived up there, one time we were taking some of the family on a hike. And we decided to go up onto a glacier. Now, I recognize that can be dangerous. This particular one was not considered dangerous, but there was a trail going up a ridge. <laughs> and uh, as uh, my wife and our daughter were out ahead of me, and they're hiking up this trail, and I'm br I always bring up the rear. I'm slow. And I'm coming up the rear, and, and, uh, and I notice something. The track is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And off this side, and then off this side, started looking steeper and steeper, and all of a sudden I stopped. I was getting kind of this sense of vertigo, you know. There's a precipice here and a precipice there. And um, <laughs> I called out to my, my wife and daughter were handling it just fine, but I'm not the steadiest person in the world. My knees don't cooperate all the time. And I'm standing there, and I said, hey, I'm going back. See you later. And I found myself going like this. <laughs> I was afraid to take another step forward. And I certainly wasn't going to take a step sideways. <clears throat> well, the Lord promises that as we follow this narrow path, if we keep our eyes on him... We don't need to turn around. If we keep our eyes on him, he'll keep us from following, falling in those precipices. I think Ellen White was thinking of that 
when she wrote, the track of truth lies close beside the track of error. 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 Truth. Stay on the track. Keep your eyes on Jesus. One of the best ways to handle all these messages out there is to ignore them. Ours is a perilous age for Christians, not only from unbelief, but a willingness to believe too much. The false lies beside the true. The drives of human needs and the hype of marketing, and by the way, I would add social media to that and the internet and all the rest, both in products and ideas, push us to make the most crucial of decisions on shallow evidence. Christ has a better way, careful searching of his word and placing utter trust in him alone. Then we can say, your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and shield. This is a positive message, not a negative one. He promises to be our hiding place. He promises to be our shield. I hope in your what? Word. Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your word, that I may live. And do not let me be ashamed of my hope. May all of you <laughs> come to recognize the pitfalls, the traps, the snares that are all around us in the messages that we hear and see and read every day. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Keep your eyes on his word. Study it. Learn of him. And you will be on safe ground. Because it's so late today, I'm going to forego the closing hymn. It's a beautiful one. I'm going to share just very briefly some of the words. It's not found in our hymnal, but very quickly we'll just, we'll just look at it. I love the sacred book of God. No other can its place supply. It points me to the saint's abode and bids me from destruction fly. Sweet book, in thee my eyes discern the image of my absent Lord. From the instructive page I learn the joys his presence will afford. But while I'm here, thou shalt supply his place. Speaking of the book, God's word. Thou shalt supply his place and tell me of his love. I'll read with faith's discerning eye and thus partake of joys above. Within thy sacred lids, <laughs> covers, <laughs> within thy sacred lids is found a transcript of my maker's will. Treasures of knowledge here abound. In this book, right here. The deepest, loftiest mind to fill. You want to fill your mind with something? You want to reason together with him? Start right here. Light of the world, thy beams impart to lead my feet through life's dark way. Oh, shine on this benighted heart, nor let me from thy guidance stray. Stay close to him. Stay close to him. And you'll be able to discern between the 
true messages and the false messages all about us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh my, Satan is so busy, has been, ever since the garden, he's been, he's been seeking to lead us astray, and he's become, I believe, even more sophisticated in his attacks. And unfortunately, as you well know, having told us in your word, uh, he uses those among us at times to lead us astray. Keep our eyes focused on you. Keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Keep our eyes focused on the Word. Keep us on the path. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.